And welcome back. This is Lisa Klarner. Before she understood why she was feeling sad and uncertain. Then she heard about social anxiety disorder, and she says immediately she knew what was wrong with her the whole time. She started therapy right away, but it took years before she was able to move beyond the disorder. Lisa wrote this book, Releasing Social Anxiety, where she shares her story and provides guidance for other people who are struggling. And Lisa joins us now. We've also asked Dr. Brad Riemann to join us to explain more about this disorder. Thanks for being here, both of Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Um, morning. Let's kind of talk through social anxiety in general. I think a lot of people have heard the term sort of as a buzzword, but they're not really sure what it means. So let's just define it first, and then we'll talk a little bit about your story and how you came to know it was you. Okay. You want me to? Sure. sure. Okay. Someone with social anxiety disorder fears embarrassment. They feel really like people are watching them or judging them. And it's simple things like going to the grocery store, going for a walk down the sidewalk in your neighborhood sitting in a classroom that caused the same level of anxiety that someone might feel when talking on live TV, <laughs> for example. Well, I was going to say, so. how impressive is it after what you've been through and the number of years that you struggled to mm -hmm. now be not only talking in front of people, but also sitting here on live TV talking about it. Mm -hmm. I bet you feel like you've come a long way. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's, and it, wasn't, it doesn't come easy. I mean, there's a lot of preparation I needed to do in order to feel comfortable and visualize. I use a lot of my techniques that I that I learned through therapy in order to feel comfortable being here. We have some um, pictures of you kind of through the years. Um, when did you first, starting when you were young, did you did you feel something was wrong even in your early school days and then through high school? It started more in my in the younger years when I started kindergarten. I was more shy, mm -hmm. and the shyness just continued through for, for up until probably around my teen years. And I was bullied, so I mean, the bullying really ended up causing it to become more of an issue. Mm -hmm. And then when it turned into social anxiety, that's where more of the, the severe and intense fear in social situations came out, and where the thoughts, I couldn't stop the thoughts from, from helping me, having me obsess about the past or uh, be so concerned about the future. It was just really difficult to manage, and I missed a lot of school mm -hmm. until I was able to get a handle on it. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what I was going to ask you, you know, for someone who thinks, oh, maybe a family member or a friend or, or someone they know has social anxiety, what are some of the, the clues? You said you, you missed a lot mm -hmm. of school. Right. Um, you know, was it that you started excluding yourself more often or mm -hmm. would you still put yourself in those situations but were just standoffish? Well, and that's the thing that, that's why I'm out doing a lot of the education on social anxiety because it is often difficult to identify it. Right. Because people... The, they feel like everybody can see all the symptoms, but they can't. Mm -hmm. So on the outside appearance, the person might appear to be fine. And that's actually what happened with me for many years. People thought I was fine. Um, but it's really more about some of the, some of the triggers of they don't want to go to a party mm -hmm. or they don't want to go to a family gathering or they're, they're not as likely to contribute in, in, in meetings at work mm -hmm. or different things like that. So, I mean, it depends on the age of the person, but those would be some of the indicators and it's some of the behaviors as well. So I mm -hmm. mean, do they avoid eye contact? Or do they, you know, are they just generally more quiet? More standoffish, mm -hmm. like Tim said. Mm -hmm. Dr. Riemann, does Lisa's story sound familiar to you? Yeah, it's quite typical actually. Um, in, and there's certainly a lot of individual variation. Uh, Lisa was describing in her case that, you know, she kind of pushed herself into these situations and put on a good face and people might not know that she was dealing with uh, a high degree of social anxiety. On the other hand, unfortunately, some people aren't able to do that. I mean, their social anxiety is so bad that they uh, really have to avoid these kinds of interactions. And they just stay home, for example. Yeah, I mean, there are people who never leave their home. Yeah, and they, st and they try to seek employment where uh, maybe they can now work out of their home or you know, through the mm -hmm. internet or something like that. Uh, obviously, as Lisa also mentioned, uh, school is very difficult. Um, social anxiety disorder tends to uh, come upon uh, individuals in their young adolescence, 12, 13, you know, that type mm -hmm. of thing. And, and school participation is such a big part of most people's grades. 
can be very, very difficult for them. Mm -hmm. I have a family member and a close friend who have social anxiety, and I think um, some of the things that I've heard them say is, you know, I don't want to stay somewhere too long because I'm afraid people just won't like me if they get to know me or if they talk to me, or sometimes it's just not going out and about. What's the good news with social anxiety? How do you reverse it or at least treat it or give people techniques to be able to combat it and, and be social again? Well, the good news is Lisa. Yeah. Right? I mean, she's a perfect example uh, of the good news. Social anxiety disorder is actually a, a, a very treatable problem when treated properly. And, and Lisa and I were talking a little bit about this before uh, we came on, which um, it's, it's the right kind of treatment. And the treatment of choice for this seems to be something called cognitive behavioral therapy, or CBT, mm -hmm. uh, which is a teaching model. It trains people in skills that have been found to be very effective in managing social anxiety and reducing the avoidance that inevitably occurs and allowing people to live a, a more free life. So you learn to change some of your thoughts. Change your thoughts, change your behaviors, learn to manage the physical aspects of anxiety and, and, and uh, realizing that social anxiety is a natural, normal human emotion. I mean, we all have some mm -hmm. social anxiety. We, we all feel maybe uncomfortable going into a room of full of people that we don't know. Mm -hmm. um, so, so the goal is not to eliminate social anxiety because that's part of the human condition, but it's to reduce it to a manageable level where they no longer have to be concerned about it. Mm -hmm. I've talked before on this show about having anxiety myself, and I did a lot of different forms of treatment before I got to the point where I tried cognitive behavioral therapy. And I think like you, mm -hmm. I struggled <laughs> for 10 years or more mm -hmm. um, before getting the, the help I needed and the, the, the tools that I needed. I, is it common for people to, to need 10 years of therapy? I mean, how long does it usually take for someone to go through a process of something like cognitive behavioral therapy to get to a point where they can manage some of the stress or anxiety mm -hmm. of dealing with different situations? Yeah, for most people, when you hear of a 10 or 12 year kind of therapy history, it's unfortunately because they really weren't locked into the right kind. Uh, mm -hmm. So, you know, I think that that's a fairly typical story uh, because people have tried other more traditional kinds of therapies, which may be very helpful for other types of problems. But when it comes to anxiety, this, the CBT is really the key. Mm -hmm. um, typically, if, if someone is in that type of a program, however, uh, results can certainly occur much quicker. Uh, for a lot of people, but again, there's a lot of individual difference. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you think that a lot of people um, who have had struggles with social anxiety turn to things like alcohol or drugs, something to kind of, you know, ease their anxiety when they're out in public? Yeah, unfortunately, and that was an, another thing Lisa mm -hmm. and I were talking about before the show, especially in men. Mm -hmm. um, men uh, frequently will self-medicate their anxiety. Um, we hear things like liquid courage and these mm -hmm. kinds of things, you mm -hmm. know, for people to to, to reduce their social anxiety, which will allow them to socialize, go to gatherings, but also, unfortunately, sometimes enable them to go to work, which obviously that can be a real, real problem. What are some of the physical symptoms? Because I know you mentioned, you know, that there's physical issues and maybe you want to talk about it, or you want to talk about mm -hmm. some of the things that you feel when you're <laughs> in, put in a situation that makes you feel anxious. There's a, it, everybody would have just a general, some, some certain symptoms that would be more impactful to them or bother them more. So it might be trembling, like their hands might shake, or sweating, or blushing, or it, it's just, it, everything is intensified. So the person who's having the symptoms feels like it's just so obvious. They don't want to write out checks at the grocery store because their hands are shaking so much. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. And quickly, was cognitive behavioral therapy the answer for you? It was, yes. It got me, it ha I had took some great strides in some of the cognitive behavioral work that I had done to be able to get some evidence that my, my thoughts that I was having were not rational after all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's a wonderful mm -hmm. feeling to know that they're not rational right. and be able to work through that. Mm -hmm. We appreciate your time so much. Yeah. We want to share some information about your book, and then we've asked you to stick around for just a little bit to answer some viewer questions. Mm -hmm. So first of all, you can find out more about Lisa and her book by calling this phone number. It's 920 Four seven five fifty two fifty two. The book again is called Releasing the Secret Pain, and you can go go to releasingsocialanxiety.com to find out more about the book as well as Lisa's story. And again, they've both agreed to stick around for just a bit, and we'll take your questions. So stay with us. Mm -hmm. Thanks, you guys. And we're back now with Dr. Brad Riemann and Lisa Klarner to answer viewer questions about social anxiety disorder. And we didn't mention, Dr. Riemann, that you're with Rogers Memorial Hospital, and that's where you do yeah. a lot of your, your work. There was something that you guys, we were talking about during the commercial break that I thought would be great to share with people, and, mm -hmm. and that is that some amount of anxiety is normal, because you were talking about preparation. Mm -hmm. I mean, being on live television is not easy for the average person. 
Right, I mean, for somebody who has an anxiety disorder, they need to start to recognize when is it no longer a disorder but normalcy. Mm -hmm. When is it normal? So anybody should, would have to prepare through breathing and visualizing success and just having a positive mindset about an experience when there's something like this going on. Mm -hmm. Well, I think a lot of the techniques that you use, which we'll break down in just a little bit, some of those, um, I, I think they're good for everyone, whether you have anxiety or you're just going into a situation that you want to feel successful or more confident or more comfortable because they're techniques that truly can set you up for mm -hmm. success. Um, so we'll give those in a second, but we want to make sure we get to some questions. Mm -hmm. One of the questions someone wrote to us is, I have anxiety in small groups. I get invited out for play dates with my kids and don't go when I don't have an excuse. Well, it's easy for me to talk to people and meet people. I can't seem to follow up and make friends. No one really knows that I deal with anxiety, but mm -hmm. she does. And that, I mean, I can, I can relate to the question because I, I myself, it really has to do with the thoughts that the person would be having about themselves. Mm -hmm. So they're going to be concerned about, I won't know what to say. And when I am there, everybody is going to be looking at me and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something stupid and just feeling really bad about not being able to function socially and not having the social skills necessary. And that's something you hear quite often too, I'm sure. Yeah, and, and, and the, the example uh, from the question, um, most people with social anxiety disorder are, are very worried about that initial meeting. So in this case, this person apparently, for some reason, is able to kind of push themselves through and maybe even be comfortable with that. But there's this concern about uh, as they get to know people more, perhaps people are going to be able to see through uh, kind of that mm -hmm. veil of, of, of putting on the good face and then realize, mm -hmm. oh my gosh, they're anxious. And people with social anxiety are, are really worried that they're going to do or say something that would embarrass themselves and then somehow be negatively evaluated. So again, this person uh, maybe is concerned that as they, as they get to know each other better, people are going to realize they're anxious in a social situation that most people shouldn't be mm -hmm. socially anxious. And they'll think, aha, there's something wrong with this person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're running out of time, unfortunately. We had one other one where they talked about having an anxiety attack and using distraction in their mm -hmm. mind. Is that mm -hmm. a technique that you're a fan of? Well, I mean, in the, in the heat of the moment, Molly, I mean, if somebody's got to do whatever it takes to get through it, but overall, from a treatment standpoint, we really want to provide people with skills so that they don't have to distract, so that they can mm -hmm. go into these situations and not feel the need to do that, ultimately. And you use breathing techniques, because Tiff talked, um, breaking mm -hmm. it down, and, and we're running out of time, but breathing techni techniques, really learning to slow it down right. is one, one. It's more about being mindful, mm -hmm. so mindful of the breath and feeling the breath coming in. And, and managing the physical really symptoms of anxiety right. through, through proper breathing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Breathing it, is a key. What's mm -hmm. one other technique that you use? You said visualization. Visualization. So when I'm meditating, then I would visualize myself here on television talking and visualize that it's going successfully. Well, and, and I right. think it has gone successfully. Yeah. I'm really impressed um, with you, with what you've been through to be able, you seem very mm -hmm. calm to me. And, and I hope that when you look back yeah. on this, you feel like it was successful because I think what you visualized actually happened today. And I think it's impressive to go from where you were to being on live television and seem, and seem calm, cool, and collected. Mm -hmm. Would you agree? Absolutely. Yeah. Definitely A plus. Yeah. Yep. That's the good news. And I think that's what we want to leave people with, whether it's general anxiety or social anxiety or some other form that there is hope. And again, if you'd like to check out more about Lisa's book, it's called Releasing the Secret Pain. There it is again, the phone number as well as the website for more information. I appreciate your time, you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. My pleasure. It's awesome. Thank you.